Now, what is your name? Marnie Hughes Warrington. And what are you an expert in? I'm a philosopher who works on what people think history is and what it's for. Oh, and uh, are we alone in the universe? Probably not, if you think about it. What do you think about when you say, why do you say probably not? Well, I always wonder why we think of ourselves as so exceptional. And if you thought about the question statistically or from first principles, then logically there's a possibility that we're not the only inhabited place. Okay, so you want to exclude the idea that life is a quirky thing that is, is so rare that it would only happen once in, out of a billion planets. Yeah, absolutely. I sometimes think that Occam's razor is a bit of a problem because we collapse down too quickly. And it might be the case that we need to be a bit more open-minded. All right, so you think we are not alone in the universe. Hmm. Okay, when I asked you the question, are we alone, what did you understand by the word we? Um, I don't understand it as just being about humans. I appreciate the fact that um, history and change are not just about human beings. They're about um, single cell organisms right through to quite complex organisms of which we are very complex. We have communication, but of course we are one of a number of organisms on this planet. So what we means is quite a diverse range of, diverse range of life forms. Life forms. Mm. Okay, how about the word alone? Some people uh, think we will still be alone if we discover life elsewhere because we won't, much of it we won't be able to talk to, and therefore we will be alone. What is your view on that? Oh, Charlie, this has turned into a fabulous philosophical conversation, right, which well, excites that's why. me <laughs> a lot. Um, a lot of people will think the word alone suggests that, for instance, we're quite special in that the question the we is about human beings, and the alone might point to things like the fact that we have language or that we have complex social interactions that you might not anticipate for other kinds of life forms. Well, I took a broader view of the word we when I answered the question you the did? first time. Consequently, I don't know that the word alone therefore suggests that we're looking for a life form that necessarily has communication skills or social skills like we do. Okay, and uh, do you think the question, are we alone, is an important one? Yes, it is an important one because I think sometimes when we think about change and we think about the world, we get so bound up in who we are that we actually forget to tell the story and to think about the changes that other organisms might be undertaking or that there might be other possibilities in other places that lead us to tell a different story or lead us to think about the environment in different ways and lead us to think about habitable spaces in different ways. So you think the question, are we alone, opens up some thoughts that you might not otherwise not have? Yes, absolutely. Uh, and of course you would expect a philosopher to get really excited about that. Um, if the life forms are so potentially different, for instance, that they might challenge uh, current definitions of life or stretch them in some really interesting ways or that they might be inhabiting places that we think are dreadful from our own lights. I actually think it does push the boundaries for us in really wonderful ways. Well, since you talked about de definitions of life, do you think, uh, I don't know, do you think uh, Canberra is alive? Yeah, some people thought that it wasn't alive. When, <laughs> yeah. Okay, but how about, how about Australia? Is Australia? How about the biosphere? Is the biosphere alive? The biosphere is How about your alive. left finger what there was that alive well it's an interesting question people think it's it's uh it's about those cells and the cells being able to reproduce of course well cells of course can be on their own or they can be cooperating with other cells to form multicellular organization um, so my finger is in a way an ecosystem yeah absolutely ecosystems are alive yeah i do i How do about the entire that. biosphere yes i do so you're a lynn margulis fan well, yes, I am a Lim Mangolas fan, but I'm not sure that I would stretch then to say, do we need concepts like Gaia, for instance? I'm not sure about that. I do. So you're think not that much of a Lim Mangolas fan. <laughs> yeah, I'm kind of, you know, I, I really, what I do appreciate it about the fact is that it, it asks you to look at different scales and to think about life on the tiniest scales, but also on the biggest, the biggest scales, and whether there are life systems as well as individual life forms. Some people have talked about if there's life elsewhere on other planets, another planet, another planet, another planet, then, and let's say that life goes extinct on the hundred and stays on one, mm -hmm. that we cannot use that as a metaphor, as an analogy. That is not Darwinian evolution. It's mm -hmm. rather per differential persistence mm -hmm. rather than differential reproduction. Do you have a view on that? No, I don't know because I don't know. Well, it's a good hypothetical. It's a very interesting one, but I would need more information and say, well, why did it happen? How did it happen? In other, well, other let's, say, let's say the thing got too hot or too oh, okay. cold or okay. lost all its water and then the sure. life died out here. Life died out. For example, sure, sure. it might have been life on Mars yeah. and it just died out. Yep. And uh, so if we look at that from a, a broader perspective, then we have 
life evolving, not only on a planetary yes. scale, but on a yes, galactic scale. Yes, and that is a possibility. Yeah. That's a possibility. Yeah, okay, you're happy with it. Now, this search for, there seems to be a scientific search for understanding how we got here. Mm -hmm. And uh, is that, I mean, are we alone as part of that? And do you think, well, is that important? This oh, science? absolutely. Why? I mean, Why? The kind of philosophy that I do is called metaphysics. Uh, and it's a branch of, it's a very ancient branch of philosophy which tries to make sense of things. So what are the kind of ground rules for being who we are, how we make sense of the world? And history is just one part of that, for instance, or what we think a life form is. I actually think these are probably the most important questions people can ask because it, it leads to us thinking about our world in particular ways and treating one another differently. So I do think it's critical. <clears throat> but you know a large fraction of the people on this planet don't agree with you. Oh, that's completely fine, but my <laughs> job as a philosopher is never to run with the crowd and always to ask deep questions. So let's suppose that I'm a member of that crowd and I don't think this is an important question. Can you convince me in a minute? Sure. So um, the way that you think about me um, can determine whether you treat me fairly or unfairly, right? Now, I might be a human being and you might treat me fairly or unfairly because of the rules that you have about treating me. I could actually be a single cell organism and you might treat me fairly or unfairly as well. So, fairly. Yeah, take an example. So there's ethics mm. approval processes for lots of research that people do. And people discriminate between organisms that have spinal cords and organisms that don't have spinal they cords. They sure do. Right, so why do they do that? Well, and genetic proximity? Possibly. Um, we got another example? We got another complexity. Complexity. I it see. could be. Uh, it could be that there's particular families that they're interested in, which is not necessarily about proximity, but you know, some notion of heritage. Now, is that fair? So what I'm trying to get you to think about is whether the rules that we've drawn up there are actually right. Well, that relates to my question I was going to ask you. You're, I'm going to ask you if you're a racist, and you'll probably say, no, I'm not a racist. Then I'm going to say, are you a speciesist? <laughs> so are you a speciesist? I just saw a documentary about Diane Fossey, who mm -hmm. loved her gorillas, and she thought the gorillas were more important than the people of Rwanda. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of an interesting flip on the normal take. So are you a speciesist? Do you think humans are more important than other species? I actually do think humans are really important. Um, I didn't ask you that. Oh. I said, are they more important than other species? Not always, no. Not always? Not always. For example? So it could be, for instance, that I might take some actions as a human being that I think are wonderful for us, but actually lead to changes in the biosphere that are deleterious for other organisms, really catastrophic changes that could actually end up being catastrophic for us as well. Yes. So my single-mindedness about us could actually lead to some dreadful outcomes. Arthur C. Clarke said that any sufficiently advanced technology will be, in, will be indistinguishable from magic. But there's a guy named Carl Schroeder in Germany who said, no, no, Arthur, you're wrong. Any sufficiently advanced technology will be indistinguishable from nature. Mm. And so I guess this guy was a tree hugger. He liked ecology, and he thought that, uh, I guess, forests are more important than uh, parking lots. you have a view on that? Uh? Mm. No, I, I think my view is to say it's, it's wrong to ask the question and only to think about the parking lot or only to think about the forest. Um, I'm actually really, as a metaphysician, I'm interested in systems. Of thinking, to put it really crudely, to say, well, if I built the car park, am I removing the forest? And if I did do that, do I remove spaces for animals? Do I upset the atmosphere in particular ways? Do I create more runoff that changes the way oxygen is moving through the ocean? I like to think about things in a really interconnected, interconnected way. <clears throat> I, I do too. You used the word animals. Did you mean non-human animals or did yeah. you mean humans as well? No, I always try and take as broad a church, oh. <laughs> church as possible. <laughs> All right, so I asked you if you were a racist and you presumably said no, but you have a species system. Yeah, no, I'm so happy to confirm no, not a racist. <laughs> but, but you seem to be, uh, you seem to be uh, saying that you are a speciesist mm. in mm. some circumstances. In some circumstances, I think that's right. Uh -huh. So do you think if every species was speciesist, that would be, uh, in some circumstances, that would be right? Well, welcome to the complex world of ethics and philosophy, yes, yes. <laughs> where well, it's not always easy to make determinations about the right thing to do or the fair thing to do. Here's an ethical question. Uh, Stephen Hawking, who recently died, said that we should keep our head low, that we should not necessarily broadcast our existence to outer space because he, he used the history of the contact between some peoples and other peoples on Earth as a as an analogy, thinking, wow, that's been disastrous, genocide, ethnic cleansing, etc. So he doesn't want us to be on the receiving end of genocide, and so he thinks we should keep our head down. Now, other people think, oh no, these aliens are 
advanced, they will be ethically advanced, and therefore they won't go around killing what to them seem like amoebas. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, we kill amoebas all the time. Mm -hmm. So if you look at the math, you get about a two billion year difference in the amount of time life has evolved on Earth compared to these older Earths. Mm -hmm. So do you have a take on uh, alien ethics? I don't know that it, it, you're not even going to arrive at the word ethics because some of the problems that we had from first contact was not actually an ethical problem but also a disease problem. So before we even get to the conversation about whether the aliens are going to treat us fairly and be polite to us, they actually may be life forms that are immune to particular forms of disease or live in environments that we find toxic or may pass on to us. And so there's a lot of really good history to show that that first contact led to the spread of weeds but it also actually eradicated or really affected populations quite dramatically, even before people said hello to one another. But that was because we were so closely related to them. Yes. And, and the aliens presumably yeah, and it will could not be. be closely related to us, and therefore the idea of a, a virus that is plaguing the aliens that would, same, would plague us seems to me far-fetched. Well, possibly not, but I also believe in vectors because <laughs> the history of disease suggests that sometimes things leap through other things, so I'm not going to rule out the possibility. <laughs> okay, all right, all right. How about artificial life? What do you think of artificial life, of, uh, you know, robots and AI taking over and uh, how ethics might change if we have intelligent uh, robots? I, I like to think of robots at the moment as being really in our own lights, the, the thing that our own lights? Yeah, in, um, so created by our own design. Mm -hmm. They're restricted by our own ways of thinking. So the thing that would really excite me about AI and AI life if it is the possibility that we could actually create life that was not like us, that were quite different. At the moment, we, we put all the inputs in. We create the robots. They come and kill us or they treat us fairly. Mm -hmm. They behave in ways that we recognise. I think it becomes seriously interesting when we talk about robots not being like us. So at the moment, I, I don't view them typically as a separate form of life or nor a form of life. They're just a reflection or a kind of shadow of who we are. <clears throat> um, do you think that once you have life on a planet that you will get intelligent life? You have to have a broad view of intelligence, don't you? I mean, we tie up notions of intelligence with language and social learning, which I... Let's Agree talk about with. technological intelligence. Well, like absolutely. And the, telescopes and, uh, and UFOs. And well, so. well, but let's pull it back and actually talk about tool use, right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so there are actually species, of course, that do use tools and they communicate with one another in ways we don't understand. Mm -hmm. But there is a kind of intelligence about okay. that. Okay, let's <clears throat> kill all the humans on Earth, mm -hmm. do an experiment, and ask, do you think any... How long would it take, or if at all, somebody or some species would evolve a telescope and a camera and a computer? Well, the philosopher will ask, always ask, why do they need the, t the telescope and the camera in the first place? Do they actually need it? Um, and yes, it is possible that they could evolve and it might take around the same time, you know, 3.8 million, something like well, that. All the species have already been here as long as we have, yeah, right? Yeah, but so. things are consistently changing, so it's a possibility that it could change. And it might take around the same time. Well, how long did it take us to build a telescope? Was it... 10 years, 100 years, 1,000 oh, no, years, a million about, years, no, 10 no, million years, 100 years. It's only about 500 years. It's quite recent, really. <laughs> well, well, wait, that's when we first invented them. But when, when you, but from the time there was origin of life to mm. the telescope, it was 4 billion. Yeah, it's huge. And so you're not suggesting that it would take a chimpanzee 4 billion years no. to make a telescope? No. It would take on over about 500 years, if we thought about it, from recorded oh, science. Okay, here's, a, here's a more of a question. Let's suppose that... Uh, uh, Cook never came, the Europeans never expanded out of Europe, and then we had hunter gatherers all over the place. Mm. And would, do you think the Neolithic Revolution would have happened, you know, the agriculture and cities? Is that something that you think is built into humans, mm. or would we stay hunter gatherers for ever, or as long as ever? Look, forever. there's sufficiently good evidence to show that agriculture didn't just rise in one place. It actually arose in different places relatively simultaneously. It's also clear that there, it didn't arise in some other places as well, or people remained in those modes because of the environments that people occupy. Now, it could be that there's a different way of thinking about agriculture that may flourish in Australia, for instance, but I don't see agriculture as a single point of origin story, and nor do I see it as necessarily that it was tried here and failed in Australia. Mm. I actually think that the way in which indigenous peoples were living in Australia was highly successful for the nature of the landscape that they were occupying. Let's talk about complexity in a general sense. A lot of people think that over the past four billion years, or even longer in, in the universe, that life is uh, 
life gets more complex as it evolves. Do you think there's anything, do you agree with that? Oh, look, I th certainly think that is the case. If you look at patterns, there is more complexity. But, um, Can you give an example of more complexity? Ah, well, look, language use and sophisticated communication styles and use of technologies to support enhanced extended. So people talk about extended minds. So human beings have invented computers because they can't store it all up here, for instance. Um, or so we're not. more complex than we were 10,000 yes. years ago? Yes, because we've, we've figured out a way of actually extending our mind function in lots of interesting ways. We're bipedal, we weren't that before. So there are some things that are different and probably more complex about us than were before. It's interesting, as somebody who works on what histories are and what people think they're for, some people think it is a story of complexity. Other people think it's a story about entropy. Um, other people think it's, it's predominantly a story around social learning and collective learning. Other people think it's a, it's a story of, of, you know, essentially the sun's just going to come and eat us up. Charlie, the interesting thing is that people have different views about how that story should be told. Right, but complexity is something that uh, many people try to define, and you know, scientists, mm. you like to quantify something so mm. you can measure it. Now, this has, seems to have successfully avoided measure, being measured yep. in, in many people's view. But you seem to think that that's okay. You can, it's all, complexity is something that you're confident enough that you think that it is increasing, whatever it is. Look, I said no. More particularly, I said in some cases. Now, what did Aristotle say? What advice would he have? Did he, he talk about complexity? He actually talked about some knowledge being exact and some knowledge being inexact mm -hmm. and saying some of the most important knowledge was actually inexact knowledge. That science, for instance, would seek exactness about the way it measured things and talk about measurement and that other forms of knowledge, such as ethics or politics or other things, would not be exact knowledge. Like how good something is or how beautiful or Correct. how much somebody loves you. Correct. And complexity could actually be one of those concepts, I think. So a scientist might go about measuring that if they want to. And they could perform an experiment to say, within this domain, with this organism, perhaps it is more complex. But somebody who's actually telling a global history, for instance, would say, actually, it's a much bigger story than that. And I don't think it is an exact term in that case. A lot of people think that multicellular organisms are more complex than single-celled organisms. Mm -hmm. And I push back on that by saying, wait a minute, multicellular things are kind of like a monoculture. And, and the bacteria have access to much, many more chemical, much more chemical diversity and me me metabolisms. They can eat plastic or eat cement, and, and we can't. And so, uh, and they have access to the genes of the, all, all the individuals around them by horizontal gene transfer, and we don't. We're sexually isolated. Mm. So from that point of view, they're more complex chemically than we are. We're morphologically complex. Do you mm. buy that? Actually, the word I'd use is they're more successful. Um, I actually think... You, you think <laughs> bacteria more successful? Cyanobacteria, for instance, are actually a really successful thing. They How do you measure success? Well, longevity. Longevity. How long they've been on the planet. How long they've been on the Everybody's planet. Everybody's been here four billion years. That's right. They haven't needed to so really... So all have so equal success. Well, there's a question there about whether you judge uh, complexity is better because a, a multicellular organism is going through so many changes. You might actually say success springs from the least amount of change. The species actually has prevailed and sustained itself over that length of time. It actually might be a more successful species. Hmm. Okay. Let's see. <laughs> 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 that got you thinking. <laughs> if, I, if I give you a hundred billion dollars with the caveat you have to spend it to try to answer the question, are we alone? How would you spend it? Oh, uh, see, you scientists love throwing lots of money at. I just gave you a hundred billion dollars. This is a thought. You philosophers like thought experiments. We we do. Um, <coughs> we can get by on a pencil and a piece of paper. I'm not mm -hmm. sure. I'm not going to spend. Here. I'm not going to spend a hell of a lot. I'm not asking for a, I'm not asking for a spreadsheet here. <laughs> <laughs> How would I spend it? Yes. Um, look, I'm not in a rush to build anything, and I'm not in a rush to build any spaceships to take me off anywhere. I'm not going to do a kind of SpaceX and say, let's go and fly. I actually think, Charlie, to be honest with you, I'm not sure that we have stretched our minds as much as we might on the possibilities and the boundaries of life. So I would want a good bit more thinking. So give it to some philosophers then. Ah, uh, probably, yes. We're a lot cheaper. Um, but the other question is, it, it could be I build my spaceship. It's fantastic. It takes me to other places. I get close to some exoplanets, for instance. It takes me to those places, and I haven't really thought about life as broadly as I might have done, and I may not recognise it. And that's a possibility, isn't it? Yes, it seems. Yes, I would agree with you there. So, so we're always taught in science that you shouldn't just rush to observe things. You've always got to have your hypothesis first. So the question for all of us is, have we um, given that concept of life as much thought in terms of hypothesis as we need to in order to make the empirical work 
as successful as possible. So are you saying that my colleagues haven't thought about enough about what they're looking for? I'm a philosopher. What would you expect <laughs> me to say? <laughs> okay. what, what, why this is relevant is because some scientists think once you have life, you have intelligent life. Once you have intelligent life, you have computers and silicon-based life. Mm. You're not wet and squishy anymore. You're, you don't have to stay on the surface of a planet. Mm. So that's very important of should we go looking for life anywhere in outer space, i.e. looking for satellites, or B, looking for squishy life on the surface of planets. So that's an issue. you have any opinion on that? Look, it's a model. You'd say, absolutely, it's a good start. It, it could be that that's what you're looking for. But again, the view of the philosopher would say is, well, is that your only... Is that your only option? I'd rather go to the table. There are two options that, there. One well, is squishy two, or... Squishy or... But or they're just models. They're models. And so I'd say, okay, are there any more left boundary models that you want to propose in that space? So a question for you, Charlie, is whether you think the theories of life are sufficiently differentiated. Is there enough differentiated thought on this? Are people coming back to similar assumptions over and over again? And, and that could be because they're based on good empirical evidence and we're very happy with that. But me, the metaphysician, says, or are we just landing on those things because we've got a constrained set of rules? Well, my answer to that question is I would quote a philosopher, Nietzsche, who wrote in the Genealogy of Morality. He says, if something has evolved, you can't define it. Hmm? That's what it says somewhere. And that's a paraphrase of what he says <laughs> in there somewhere. And I said, oh, boy, that's profound. I like that. And so I've been going around to all these conferences telling we can't, it, it has evolved, therefore we can't define it. In other words, we can talk about how it transitioned from this to this to this to mm. this to this, and it will keep on going, and to pretend that it's something fixed that we can define. It's not, it, it's not like that. It's not. And that's, that's a very naturalistic understanding because we have to go from not life to life, and that's the only way to do it. Uh, so you would agree with that? Yeah, and that's, that, I guess my point was about the rules there. People are... Um, <laughs> Somebody said to me recently, uh, humans are natural Bayesians. We just we hone in on things and we want to make rules and, and solidify things really, really quickly. And I think that can be to our peril because it means that we, we try and build up a chain of explanation to say this is what it is, this is what it is. And you can actually miss some of the most profound thoughts and possibilities about things being different to those chains. Okay, so for example, I think you have neurons in your brain and those neurons probably don't know that they're part of a brain. Mm. Could that be our situation? Maybe could we be part of an alien and we not know it? Oh, look, we always like to think that we might be a brain in a vat waking up in the morning or, you know. <laughs> wait, wait, all of us be brain that, the same brain? One brain no, or No, no, you're, you're part of my brain in a vat. <laughs> okay. Okay. Philosophers oh, are famous I for see. our yes, experiments yes, about whether we're, you know, crumbs in the pock of a giant or whether we're... Yes, yes, yes. Uh, these are some of the most interesting okay. things. Okay, how do you test that? How do we test if we're inside of an alien? Um, look, yeah, exactly. You burst out like the film. Like the something. Truman Show, yeah. right? That's what you do. You sail to the horizon. So yeah, you, and you bump into, into a wall. No, no, I was thinking the film Alien. Of course, oh. the alien emerges from oh, yes, the yes, yes. That's, yes. How, that's the that's inside. How you that's do it. Well, Bishop Barclay, of course, he said the solution is to go off and kick a stone. And if it hurts, mm. then you know you've got some material presence there. Mm. That doesn't help me with the alien because the alien might, the stone might be in the stomach of the alien. So, yeah, it's, it's, what, th those thought experiments, they're fun. But at the end of the day, you say, does it get me anywhere? What, what is the point? Mm, what kind those? of instrument do I need to figure out if I'm inside of an alien? <laughs> uh, how about um, now, would you invest any money of this hundred billion that I just gave you in microscopes to look for nano aliens, little miniature spacecraft that are f obviously filling this room that we don't know about because they're so small? Look, it could be interesting because we do spend, you know, a fair bit on looking for macro level mm. uh, differences, which you'd expect people to do. Uh, it's fantastic, but yeah, I do think the nano and the pico is really interesting. Um, Enough to spend one percent of your hundred billion on? Look, I'm only at the moment spending it on some philosophers and yes. paper and pencils, so I think I've got a bit of budget to spend. I can do that, <laughs> but, but, I, but, but I'm doing that because I'm just curious about that. <laughs> another, you, you mentioned that uh, you need to have a good hypothesis before you do a scientific experiment. That's only partly true, part of the time, because a lot of science depends on serendipitous. Ex you know, hey, look, yep. they explore a parameter space with a new instrument that you've built trying to do True. this and you so wouldn't you go wouldn't that motivate you it's it's your historian wouldn't that motivate you to build some kind of instrument so it's your 100 billion yeah look but you always go into building that instrument with some presumptions about what it is you think you're looking oh, for of course but it's a new parameter space and yeah so, absolutely yeah. i could discover that i can't actually build the instrument in the way that i thought mm. or that i ended up with some gunge on the lens that actually showed me something i hadn't thought about before some gunge well, whatever. Yeah, guns in the lens. That's, a, that's the biggest problem we have. <laughs> i got a big budget. I can solve it. But the truth is, I mean, the point is that even it's not as if I go into that with an empty mind and I build the apparatus with no forming questions. I've got questions when I go and build. And, of course, I can change my mind. 
the interesting thing is, you will know, of course, Kuhn said that you go through that normal science and then the extraordinary science and back to normal science. He said, we folk in the humanities don't even start that because we don't even get to the point of consensus in the first place. Mm -hmm. We're so wildly disagreeable mm -hmm. about yeah, lots of things yeah. that actually we're quite helpful because uh, you can say to us, build an instrument and we'll have a fight about the, how, what the instrument should look like. Mm -hmm. Now, that can mean that we don't get anything built at all, which is unhelpful, mm -hmm. but it can also mean that we actually challenge seriously the parameters mm -hmm. of what we, what we yes. think we're doing there. Mm. Yes, yes, that's true. Now, you mentioned earlier about agriculture being evolved multiple times independently on Earth. Now, th this is a really important issue for us because the idea is that we have life, only one example, presumably, on this, on this planet of life. And if we look at this life, we want to see what's the most fundamental thing and are there anything any features of life on Earth that have evolved multiple times independently. And the idea being, if they're multiple times independently, then they become good candidates for what we should expect of life elsewhere. Mm. Do you have any candidates for us? Um, well, probably, so yeah, definitely agriculture. I think that's uh, domestication of animals. Agriculture. Yep, I do think domestication of animals, broadly put. Oh, wait a minute, but they're, they're I don't know, they're 50 or maybe... You know, Maybe 50 million species on this planet. I think only two do agriculture. One is some ant species and another is us. Yeah. So two out of a large fraction. That's oh, you've got to add those birds now that drop st uh, burning sticks out of the sky and you've got to... That's agriculture. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. You've got to add those now. Burning stick agriculture. <laughs> I can't remember the name of the species. Well, how about, but how about this, this general idea of trying to identify something that's independent? Now, I, I really don't think the word independent means anything. Mm. When I talk to biologists, I'm a physicist, so I think mm. independent means real independence. Mm. They mean sexually isolated sure. as, as if that meant independent. I said, that's not independent. Mm. So, for example, you said agriculture, you know, multiple it times independently. Be. You know, hey, these guys have, they could have for, a, I don't know, half a million years been traveling around with seeds and they spread seeds wherever they go and they don't call it agriculture. There's no evidence for no. it. But the people who went to the New World had that tendency and so, boop, but then it just grows into Agriculture is evidence for it, and then you say, oh, that's independent. So I would question the word independence as it's usually used by sure, either sure. social science. So what do you think of... I, I don't disagree with that, because I think people come and mistakenly say that you woke up one day and agriculture was there, and you just started mm. cultivating really knowingly what was going on. That's not true. I think the evidence does suggest that people do go through a stage of actually selectively weeding out species, preferring some over the others. So, but that happens. Mm. relatively independently in different places where people... Relatively independently. Relatively, yeah. Depends look, I'm, be, I'm trying to be careful with my language mm -hmm. here, but I do think, for instance, you can see across the world people may, for instance, um, uh, pick a tuber because it's a good, nutritious form of food when they're in a, um, mm. uh, a more uh, hunter-gatherer lifestyle. They go and pick the tuber and they pop bits back in the ground again. And people do that, right? And it doesn't, they're not saying this is agriculture, but you do see people doing that. And that, of course, selectively means that some species are getting a bit of a leg up over, over other species, for instance, or they're burning. A leg up? What if they don't have legs? Well, they don't have legs. Let's talk no, about literally heads. That. <laughs> heads. Do you think aliens will have heads? I'm very open-minded about this. I used to think it was really fun teaching uh, big history and saying to students, one of the assignments I set to them was, what, what kind of form of life do you think could there be on a, on a neutrino? <laughs> um, uh, you mean a neutron star? Yes! <laughs> a neutron star. Well, they were really flat. <laughs> that would be nuclear like. Exactly. Right? And kind of actually, like, just yeah. trying to get people to think mm -hmm. about it really, really differently and saying, mm -hmm. I, I need you to start with thinking about an environment that's not at all like our environment and therefore what the possibility for life would be in that case. And maybe there isn't a head in that case. Maybe it is that you, you could have, for instance, a distributed brain. That's a possibility, isn't it? I don't know what is an example on Earth. There's some insects that... that um, have two brains and they talk to each other in the far away rather than corpus callosum. Well, I, just, yeah, I do think it's a little bit... It's not unbounded, but I do think the notion of a collectively tightly organised brain is not necessarily there for all forms of life. Yeah. I want to get back to this question of ethics because I asked you about ethics and you talked about uh, guns, germs, and steel. You've, you've read this mm, book. Yes, absolutely. All right, so, and you talked about germs. But let's yep. just forget about the germs for a second. And you want to talk about the guns. <laughs> no, no, let's talk about ethics, about, uh, about being colonized, about what Stephen J. I mean, um, Stephen Hawking, I don't think, was afraid of germs from aliens. He was afraid mm. of just being treated like we treat amoebas. Yep. So do you think there's anything at all universal about what is often referred to as ethics in a social species called humans? I actually think this is one of the most important questions that, and I'm really, really interested in this question. At the moment, 
the guides we've got to ethics are really very predominantly focused on human to human, so individual to individual ethics. And the, the way in which we talk about ethics is predominantly set around scenarios of that kind. Should X do X to Y? So if somebody comes to the door, should I actually tell the truth and say I'm hiding somebody in the attic? We over and over again talk about this. Mm -hmm. And that means, unfortunately, we may actually neglect some of the more social dimensions of ethics. Now, there's cosmopolitan ethics where people talk about global fairness and, and rights. But I'm actually, and I don't have the answer to the question, but I'm actually really profoundly interested in the question of whether if you rescale ethics, whether it becomes something quite different. So some big historians, for instance, say if you take a bigger scale on human, uh, the human story as part of... Well, that, I thought if it was a bigger scale, it wouldn't just be human. It would oh, be completely. vertebrate. Well, we'll, like get vertebrate there. we'll get there. But the first step is if I take a bigger scale, then I might, for instance, I, I don't just see human to human interaction. I actually see environmental change. Mm -hmm. It comes into view. Then there's a question if I go beyond the human scale and I'm looking at that 13.8 million. What billion years? What is... What is the ethical story in there? Now, unfortunately, this is actually not a question that's been well trodden uh, in my field. And I think actually this is one of the most important things we could put our mind to, to help Stephen Hawking and you guys, he's rest in peace, but to help you think about and be prepared for that alien encounter should it happen. A lot of physicists are trained to just avoid thinking about being a human being. They just mm -hmm. think about, you know, object, you know, non-life, you know, stars, mm -hmm. not living or something. And uh, so... And I'm curious about, if you talk about ethics and getting bigger and bigger and bigger, are you always, ethics is about the study of the well-being of humans usually, right? Mm -hmm. And you're saying it's it's the well-being of something larger than humans. Is that what you said? Yes, I am. Okay, so like a planet. Yes, it is. Now, E.O. Wilson thinks that we should make half the planet of a big park and, and then we should preserve these other species because otherwise we're going to kill them all. Do you think that's what we should do? I I actually, as I said to you earlier, I don't think we should be taking decisions in isolation. You know, if you go over there and put the fence behind you, I actually think a lot of the things we do are system. So you think related. we're taking decisions? Then? We do take decisions that actually have implications that are well beyond the footprint of our species. Do we have free will? <laughs> That's a really complicated question. <laughs> right, I, won't, I won't go there. All right. So the question. So but yes, as somebody you, trained you, in Hegel, yes, yeah, absolutely, okay. is the right Wait, answer. You think that there are, are bacterial life on other, on other planets? We know that there are Possibly. lots and lots and lots of Yes. Well, I, Possibly. Yes. We have lots of rocky, wet planets to give you. And yeah, then, absolutely. And if life gets started, then there are all over the place. Yes. Now, the question is do you or do you not expect human like intelligence to evolve there out mm -hmm. of that life? It's, it, it's not a strange expectation. It's not a strange, but is it, uh, is it uh, one out of a billion or one out of one? Do you have any idea of how one, to give a why probability? Why are you asking a philosopher a probability or a statistical question? The most important question for me is even if it only happened once, it's still interesting because the well, singularity well, here's the with which issue. we treat ourselves here's the is issue. interesting. <clears throat> we have, it might be that the universe is spatially infinite. If yep. that's the case, there's an infinite yep. number of Earths. Yep. Now then comes the question, does that mean there are an infinite number of you? Mm. Okay. Now, if your probability is epsilon, no matter how small, there will be, because yep. epsilon times yep. infinity. Yep. But if your probability is a set of measures zero, which mathematicians yep. and philosophers are often familiar, then you might be the only one. Correct. So I'm asking whether you think, like for English language, for example, that's mm -hmm. kind of quirky people. I ask people, do you think the aliens speak English? They say, no, no, no. Do you think they'll be human-like intelligence? Oh, yes, yes, yeah. So they think that's much more of a convergent feature, mm -hmm. human-like intelligence. Uh, you share that? I'm much more open-minded about it. <laughs> <laughs> How do you measure open-mindedness? <laughs> doing a philosophy like degree is the, the ultimate. Measure measure. Right? <laughs> it's, the open, it's the ultimate. Doing a philosophy degree is a great way of measuring open-mindedness. I, I actually need us to think about the question far more carefully than just kind of flippantly saying it's going to be this or that. And I don't know that always answering the question statistically is actually the most meaningful way of answering the question either. Well, of course, you can talk about different types of intelligence, but mm. I guess in order to be contactable and operationally yeah, yeah. by setting you, people... You're thinking, then, you're thinking like a scientist. Yes, Sometimes absolutely. I do that. Yeah, you are. And I acknowledge that, and that's fine. Um, but you don't want to be into that corner. You don't want to be open-minded like a scientist. So you want to be closed into the philosopher corner. No, I don't. I actually <laughs> want to say to you... <laughs> My um, open-minded little box over there. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I can say to you, yes, of course you can use statistics to help you, guide you in that question, mm. but it is not the only way to answer the question, and it is not always the case that... How else are you going to answer the question? Well, but it's also not the case that just because there's not much of something, then it's not significant either. Right. I didn't ask about significance. I was asking about and, should and, we expect human-like... 
Okay. And I will, because <laughs> okay. I think it is important. <laughs> okay. Well, because we study things because we think they're significant. I mean, that's yeah. why you're having these conversations, because you think this is important, and it is. It's really important. Well, maybe we just like to make jokes out of it. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> There's, it's fun, too. But I actually think this is, these are some of the most profound questions we can ask. But interestingly enough, when I asked you about are we alone, you said probably not. And, and so you have it, you've given a probability to the origin of life that's mm. significantly large. When I ask you about human-like intelligent life, you then say, well, pff, all bets are off. So why you have so mm. much more confidence in the origin of life being something that's highly, a larger probable mm -hmm. than human-like intelligence? So how are you interpreting the word probably as I used it in that case? Are you assuming that I used it scientifically? I assume that if there are going to be a thousand or a million or a billion Earth-like planets out there, that there'll be some other life there. And I might not have used the term mathematically in that sense. Okay. <laughs> so when I said, let's, let's get back to it. Are we alone in the universe? No. Why do you say that? Because I think there's a possibility. Uh, I think from principles that there's nothing to expect that we would be singular. Why, okay. why would we assume that we're singular? Analogous question. Do you think there are other organisms in the universe with human-like intelligence? Why wouldn't there be? And you answer those two different... Th yeah, those and, I can ask, and I can ask... Yes, they're the same answer. They're why wouldn't there be? Why wouldn't there be? Why wouldn't there be? Why wouldn't there be? Okay, let me ask you this. Do you think there are aliens that are speaking English out there? Why wouldn't there be? Okay, do you think there's people speaking English with an American accent or a Brooklyn accent out there? Why wouldn't there be? There wouldn't be because I'm getting quirkier and quirkier and quirkier <laughs> Possibly, on Possibly, yes. <laughs> so, so you don't want to acknowledge that I'm getting quirkier and quirkier? You are. You actually are getting quirkier. Yes, but that means less probable. But yes. you don't want to say that. As a philosopher, my job is to say, let's not gallop down a statistical answer in this case. You've given me some interesting ideas. And my job is to say, some of those are more interesting than others. I'm probably... I'm more interested in asking the first question first because I think it's the most significant. But isn't interest proportional to prob probability? Um, sometimes people study things even when they're unlikely, don't they? <laughs> isn't that when some of the most interesting science happens? It depends on who's... De 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 uh, they're studying it because they think that what everybody thinks is unlikely is much more likely, usually. For example, the discovery of exoplanets. Everybody else has done Well, no, no, you no, before said actually serendipity plays an important yes, part of yes, this yes. as well. And I think that's right. I think that's absolutely right. Okay, let's talk about, let's forget about your rational part of your brain. Let's talk about your emotional part of your brain here. Uh, what kind of aliens would you like to find? Um, like ones that are quite different to us. Quite different. So mm. interestingly different. Mm, interestingly different. Talk to them? Uh, oh, yeah, it'd be, gee, it'd be really interesting. I loved watching Arrival. <laughs> I really loved watching it and the notion of a different linguistic structure mm -hmm. for those aliens with their coffee ring stain language mm -hmm. uh, communicating through touch. I love the idea that, that it might be really seriously challenging for us to communicate and that we might be looking at things that, that actually we look at first sight and we're not sure it is life. I actually, that would excite me. So you think an octopus that gives off smoke is seriously challenging to communicate with? It might not be. It's just really interesting. <laughs> I, well, I guess the point I'm making is to say I would most like it if it were quite different. And perhaps if we didn't recognise it as life in the first instance. Uh, uh, that would be really, yeah. really interesting. Yes, I agree. Um, in, let me ask you an ethical question. In the movie Contact, mm. have you seen the movie Contact? Mm. Okay. In that movie, several times, importantly... I think I'm being caught. <laughs> okay, one, two more questions. Two yeah. more questions. In that movie, they say, uh, yep. "Are we alone? <laughs> are we alone?" And the answer comes, "Well, if we are, it's an awful waste of space." Mm -hmm. What do you think of that? That's yeah, an ethical. It is a good. Yeah, yeah, it's a good you, question. Do you think it? You, you would you agree with that? Well, possibly. It's a waste of space if there are no yeah, people out but there. But does that question have meaning? I'm not sure. What's the waste there? That's that's my that was my understanding. So what, why do you think if humans don't exist, there so it's a waste? Yeah, I don't understand what the waste would be there. Okay, mm -hmm. all right. And uh, what do you think the public's and students' biggest misconceptions about the question "Are we alone?" are? That it is that life is going to be like us, um, oh. and I think that's actually probably the most the biggest barriers to us understanding life and origins of life is the expectation that it will turn, turn. On, very, on very much on what we think. Okay. It, He's any, like us. Any, any advice for students who are thinking about spending their life trying to investigate this question? I think it's a great topic because it, it seriously, it's, it's interdisciplinary. 
Uh, it asks you to think about change, so history. It asks you to think about great chemistry, biology, astronomy, but philosophy as well. So I really love it as a topic because it, it has all of that boundary crossing complexity about it. And I think if you have a, a hungry mind and a curious mind, this is one of the most satisfying spaces to work in.